Please take your copy of God's Word and let's turn together to Matthew chapter 6 once again. Matthew chapter 6, our text this evening is going to be the verses 11 to 13 as As we finish tonight, this series we've been looking at really all semester long in Sunday evening praise, Jesus teaching us to pray. And over the last couple of weeks, we've been here with the Lord's Prayer. But but even with the Lord's Prayer, what we've been finding, I hope, and I'll say it again, but what I, I hope we've been finding is that what Jesus is trying to do with us in teaching us to pray is less about the how to, it's more about the want to. Uh, And as we've been talking together, not just tonight in the room, but outside the room, as you and I have been talking about this series, one of the things I think that's resonated for all of us has certainly been what God's been up to in my own heart, but I think for many of you has been this wrestling with our own hearts, this want to, to pray, and this recognition that that's really where the struggle lies. And especially in this, this pattern prayer, this, this Lord's prayer, this model prayer, uh, where Jesus teaches his disciple what it is to pray, we, what I think is going on here is Jesus, in, in giving us these six priorities that frame our praying, he's really dealing with our hearts. He's really dealing with this want to on the inside. And ultimately, he's pursuing us. He's pursuing our hearts. And he's seeking to do something within us that actually will cause us to see his passion for us, his deep and abiding love for us, so that we can come to him, whatever it is, and bring our requests to him, but more be in relationship with him. And so with that in mind, we're going to come to this text, but in order to do so, we need God's help in order to read, in order to preach, in order to hear. So let's go to him. Let's pray. Father, Son, Spirit, we do come, and we ask that you would meet with us here at the end of the Lord's day. Open our eyes of faith once again, Spirit, so that we might see glorious things, but also that you might do your work in us, so that we might long for you in ways that are far beyond what we could ask or imagine, and we might be met by you, triune God in ways that actually cause us to be satisfied. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we've been doing, we'll we'll read the entirety of the Lord's Prayer together. So, Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So as we come to the end of this time where Jesus is teaching us to pray, I I hope we've been honest enough to actually admit to ourselves, to God, to perhaps someone else, our spouse, uh, a trusted friend, that, that really where our struggle lies is not with the mechanics of prayer, with the how to. Rather, our real struggle is, is in the want to. It's, it's wanting to come, wanting to pray, wanting to talk to our Father through Jesus by the Spirit. And so to deal with this, Jesus isn't merely giving us instructions about prayer. All throughout the passages that we've looked at, he isn't merely giving instruction, and he isn't merely coming with exhortation. Though each week the the titles have been framed in the imperative, Jesus isn't coming to exhort us merely. Now, to be sure, there is instruction, there is exhortation, but, but I think Jesus is doing something more. Rather, he's... He's showing us the character of our God. And he's showing us the nature of our relationship with him. The nature of the relationship that we bear towards him and that he bears towards us. So why can we come with shameless audacity? Why can we continue to ask in faith? How is it that we should keep on asking? Well, because we come to a father who loves us. 
who is better than any earthly father that we've ever known, whether our own or one we've seen, who knows how to give good gifts to those who ask. That's, that's your father. How is it that we can ask for mercy, which is what we really need after all? How is it that we can ask for the things that we need time and again? Well, it's because we pray in Jesus' name. We pray through the mediator. We pray united to him. We pray as those who are chosen friends. We pray as those to whom the Father gives great joy. How is it we're able to watch and pray? How is it that we're able to pray not like hypocrites playing a role, but to bring the real us to the real God in times of testing and trial and temptation? Well, it's because we pray to a Father who tends and spares us, who knows our feeble frame, who loves us with a love that will not let us go. And, and even in this pattern prayer, which we often take as the ultimate how-to manual, these six priorities for prayer, what we find is that Jesus is actually penetrating to our want to. What is it that we really desire? Why do we desire it? Do we really want gifts? Yes. Do we want the giver behind the gift? Jesus uses these priorities to probe our hearts because one of the truths all throughout is that our deepest needs aren't simply for God's provision, whether it's sustenance, forgiveness, or deliverance. No, our deepest need is for God himself, for our Father's presence with us, for our Father's passion for us, to know that we are loved, that we are his beloved children. And because we are loved in this way, we're able to go whatever it is and bring whatever we have to the Father. And so even as we pray these priorities, we're really actually seeking both the gift, yes, we wouldn't ask for these things if we didn't want them, but we ultimately are asking for the God who changes us by giving the gift, but also by giving his very self. He gives us himself and his deep and abiding love for us. I mean, ultimately, that's what we're asking for when we pray for God's provision. When we pray, give us this day our daily bread, there is a sense in which we're asking, give us tomorrow's bread today. Uh, By speaking about bread, about the basic stuff of life, Jesus is calling us to pray for all the basic stuff of life. In the first century world, to, to, to look for bread, to ask for bread is to ask for that which sustains life. It was your daily wage. Each day you would be paid the denarius. Each day you would take that denarius to the marketplace to buy the bread that you and your family would eat that night. If you were fortunate, you might earn two denarius and be able to buy a loaf for the night and a loaf for the morning. It was to, to have sustenance day by day, but the Jewish mind wasn't just looking for today's bread. No, they had been taught by God all the way back in Exodus 16 that on certain days, on, on Fridays, they would get not just Friday's bread, but the Sabbath day bread too. And so part of what Jesus is teaching us to pray here is not just give us this day our daily bread, but give us the Sabbath day manna. Provide for our wants tomorrow's bread for today. But, but in coming to a God who knows that we need this, who knows our needs before we ask, we're, we're actually asking him for that which he freely gives already. And you know exactly what that's like. Sarah and I have three teenage boys, and every one of them asks almost every night, Hey, Mom. Hey, Mom, what's for dinner? I'm starving. Never mind the fact that they have never gone a day without their mother fixing their dinners. Never have gone a day without being, uh, you know, with the idea that they might starve. Knowing that they live in a household that has more than daily bread, but tomorrow and the next day also. Even though they know that their mother loves them and provides for their needs, yet they ask, Hey mom, what's for dinner? I'm starving. That's the kind of asking, I think, that's behind asking for tomorrow's bread for today from this God who 
who is our father. There's never been a day where he's not provided. Never been a day where he's not cared for you. Never been a day where he didn't know what you needed. And yet, part of what Jesus is encouraging us to do is to come to this father and to ask anyway. You may not think that applies to you. I mean, after all, we live in the richest country in the world. We are a very well-off congregation. Hardly any of us, especially tonight, will worry about tomorrow's bread for today. And yet, Jesus is going to remind us just a few verses after this prayer that, that we are anxious about life's provision I mean, he's going to say in chapter 6, verse 25 and verse 32, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? The Gentiles seek after these things. And your heavenly Father knows you need them all. Did you hear it? Your heavenly Father knows. He, needs, he knows you need provision. Tomorrow's bread for today. But he wants you to take your anxious heart to him. So are you stumped over what that might be for you? Well, I can give you some clues. Listen to your internal conversations. Listen to your worries. Listen to your anxieties. I suspect that for you, those might be those daily bread issues. You might not be worried about actual foodstuffs, although there are many in our city who are. But for you, those daily bread issues might be those deep anxieties that you have for your children, that you have for your spouse, that you have for some situation that you cannot control. And your father knows. He knows. And he wants you to take those anxieties to him because he's a father who cares for you. He wants to hear you say, hey father, I'm starving. What's for dinner? Even though he's provided again and again and again. Because he, after all, is the source of all good, the source of all your good in this world. So the father calls you even through your anxieties, come to me. Come to me. Come to me with your daily bread questions and your daily bread requests. Come to me and ask for provision. Come to me and ask for pardon. After all, we're taught to pray, forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. We tend to get hung up on the conditional language there, don't we? I mean, we we seem to worry about what's the condition and we miss the larger point, which is those who are forgiven, forgive. And those who forgive find themselves in continual need of forgiveness in order to empower their forgiveness of others. And those who don't forgive actually might not have known fully the forgiveness that they've been granted in Jesus Christ. I mean, really... It's only by living into the pardon that's already yours in Jesus Christ can you actually live in the way that Jesus calls us to in this, in this Sermon on the Mount. In the previous chapter, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus tells us to rejoice, to be glad when you're reviled and persecuted and slandered for Jesus' sake. Now, how's that possible? Only by knowing the forgiveness of Jesus. Only by being able to say, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do, just as you have forgiven me when I have been insane in my sin. Father, forgive. How is it possible to turn the other cheek when slapped, to settle when sued by giving more to the person suing, as Jesus speaks of at the end of chapter 5? Again, only by realizing that if God had taken us to court... None of us could stand, as Psalm 130 says. If you should mark iniquities, none of us could stand. And so when we come and we, we pray, forgive us, Lord, part of what we are asking for is that over 
abundant grace of forgiveness that actually compels us to be those who forgive others. And yet, how few of us actually forgive, really forgive from the heart. How quick we are to take umbrage, to separate, to leave other brothers and sisters who themselves have already been forgiven, who've already received the assurance of pardon, the absolution from Christ the high priest. How, how, how often we refuse to even consider the oddity of praying this prayer every Sunday morning as we do here at IPC while holding deep bitternesses against another. We draw our lines and we, we sit on opposite sides and we avoid one another in the hallways even while we pray this prayer. One of my favorite authors, Robert Louis Stevenson, in his picturesque notes of Edinburgh tells this legend of two Scottish sisters who lived together in a small room in Edinburgh. They fell out, he noticed, as he wrote, on some point of controversial divinity belike, but fell out so bitterly that there was never a word spoken between them, black or white, from that day forward. But there was a problem. They were so proud and so fearful of scandal and gossip that they refused to separate their living conditions. And so they concocted a, an ingenious solution. They took a chalk, piece of chalk, and they drew a chalk line upon the floor. Stevenson noted that it had bisected the doorway and the fireplace so that each could go in or out and do her cooking without violating the territory of the other. And sadly, for years, they coexisted in hateful silence. At night, in the dark watches, each could hear the breathing of their enemy. And the conclusion? With horror and sadness to see the two sisters at their devotions, thumbing a pair of great Bibles and praying aloud for each other's penitence with Maori emphasis. Why? Because they would not forgive, which raises the question of whether they'd ever actually known God's pardon. I wonder if that's part of our problem with praying. We want to hold on to our grudges. We want to hold on to our bitternesses. We want to hold the other person in debt. We want to cling to. We tell ourselves we don't, and yet, how much easier would it be, having known the full and free forgiveness of a father and regularly asking him for forgiveness to step over the chalk line that we've drawn separating us from others, to seek their forgiveness as well, to seek to forgive them as well. Forgiveness is hard. It doesn't come easily. And it particularly doesn't come easily to my stubborn, hardened heart. And that's ultimately why when we pray, forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors, it's ultimately a prayer for the Father to drive his, his gospel deep into our hearts so that we will be free to continue to risk ourselves in forgiveness as he has risked himself to forgive us. How great the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he should make a wretch a treasure. I mean, that, that's what he's done for us. That's, he's done that by his full and free pardon. So when we ask him for pardon, we're asking him for his heart, aren't we? And yet we're not only asking for provision and pardon, we also ask for protection. We pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, or perhaps better, save us from the time of trial. Deliver us from the evil one. Because that's ultimately what we're asking. When we come into the time of trial, God, protect us. God, have mercy on us. Help us to believe what we sang, what air my God ordains is right. So keep us from the enemy. Don't let him triumph over us. As with, with the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus told them, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So here, we are asking God to protect our hearts, to guard us, to deliver us. But what do we do all too often in the time of trial? Well, we double down. We make our plans. We consult many others. We work a process. How often do we stop to consider that when we come into the time of testing, 
when we come into the time of trial, when we come into the time of temptation, that God is actually already present in it, wooing our hearts to himself. The Father is here, here in the midst of trial, saying, child, come here. Come here and talk to me. I'm right here. He wants us to ask. He wants us to ask for his protection, for us to guard him, for us, for us to be delivered. You see, at each point along the way, Jesus is really teaching us that our Father wants us. He desires our hearts, our minds, ourselves. If we can only fully understand or even just gain a glimpse of, of how much he loves us, then this pattern prayer would, would really serve us as a ready doorway. A doorway not simply to get what we want from God or what we need from God, but rather this pattern prayer would serve as a doorway into the very presence of the Father. As we pray concerning God's name and reign and will, concerning God's provision, pardon, and protection, we're really walking into the house of the Father where he's seated at the head of the table, perhaps at the head of this table. And he says, welcome, child. Come here, sit down. How's it been? What do you need? Please pray with me.